is so insane. is so insane. What's up, boys and girls? Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. Yeah, boy. <laughs> well, what a week. It's been a crazy, crazy week. Or 10 days, 11 days. I was in what amounts to another country almost. Going to Montana. It's like another country. And I hope everybody enjoyed the lecture. I'm sorry that <coughs> the audio quality was not optimal. <coughs> I'm just choking on my own, <coughs> choking on my, <coughs> choking on my own lies and deceptions. Because <laughs> as you know, all we do is lie and do occult, magical, ritual workings around here. The internet has exposed us for the hundredth time as the lying sort KGB sorcerers that we are. We will be talking about some of the KGB. KGB dog, right? Doing my KGB gang. Do you know the KGB had gang signs? Doing that sea walk and I'm wearing my crip. Sure, I'm going to crips today, dog, but I'm going to be in the bloods tomorrow. The bloods and the crips and the sharks and the jets. 
If you're a jet, you're a jet all the way from your first cigarette to your last iron day. Did you know that in high school, I was in the high school play and our <sighs> Boomer High School play professor, per they're not professors, teacher, forced us to do West Side Story. And she, the only reason she wanted us to do West Side Story is so that her son could sing all of those fake and gray uh, musical notes and numbers. So that's why I know some of the lines to that musical. And no, I am a hetero cis male. So I'm not of the Skittles persuasion. I know that you're probably thinking, how do you know lines from a musical if you're not of that persuasion? Well, because our teacher made us do that. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do. I think what I wanted to do something. We had a very limited options. So it was like a Neil Simon play or West Side Story. And everybody groaned when she was like, oh, we're going to do West Side Story. Oh. So don't let your boomer mom teacher choose the high school play dog. You're going to be. You know who I was? Bernardo. I was Bernardo. My sister will not date a guy like this. Right? I was like Tony Montana, dude. Bernardo is like like the gay Tony Montana, basically. Literally. You talk to me? You talking to me? Talk to my little friend, blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it, okay? Nobody, you guys don't know what West Side Story, it's like the most famous musical. It's really dumb, but uh, all it is is another telling of Romeo and Juliet. But the Sharks and the Jets, that's, that's where we get Bloods and the Crips. Did you know the Bloods and Crips, when they fight, sometimes they will do uh, choreographed dance scenes? Yes. And in instead of singing musical numbers, they will actually rap musical numbers. The battle rap. So, really, the world is no different than it was back in the 50s, in the days of West Side Story. You can support the stream and learn such amazing historical facts and insights as that right there those those facts you just learn those historical facts you wouldn't learn that anywhere else the origins of uh sea walking crips and blood sea walking comes out of west side story the original uh gangs of new york and gangs of la were both sharks and jets and in in la they weren't sharks and jets they were the dolphins and the crustaceans and the dolphins and the crustaceans had a ferocious rivalry for many years a lot of rappers coming out of that scene a lot of a lot of ocean themed rappers pirate themed rap coming out of that scene a lot of people don't know this but Fascinating, fascinating uh, history of the arts. But you can support the show with Super Chats. And Super Chats, as you guys know, are now via the Streamlabs. So you can hit us up via Streamlabs right there, baby. Right there. You like how my voice just went into that. My voice is just going. My voice is getting deeper, by the way. I think my uh, testicles have finally dropped. So I think that that's precisely why you're hearing a, a much more... Barrow to I mean I'm basically Barry White now. I'm like Barry White but white Barry White boy. I'm Barry White boy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Come on, come on. My my baby, come on, come on. I wanna be with you right now is all I wanna do. Mana. I'm trying to remember the lyrics. 
what the world is looking for. I found what the world is looking for right here, baby, at my front door. <laughs> I bet you didn't expect Barry White boy. Barry White boy white board. That's what happened in Montana. How does that song go? Yeah, come on, baby. Oh, yeah. Oh, right now. Right now. Barry White lyrics. My Jamie didn't know who the Oak Ridge Boys were. So I was like, you don't know who the Oak Ridge Boys are? Baby, get it together. Oh, no, wait, that's not it. It just is Barry White lyrics. Like, there's just five lyrics. Get it together. Baby, get it together. <laughs> Never gonna give you up. That's it. Never gonna blah, blah, blah. Now, I'm, this is all a bunch of pop-ups, dude. Come on. Never gonna give you up. Right here. Anyway, we so don't you love this stream of consciousness? People watch this and they're like, this person has uh, the schizoids. He's got the schizos because we don't know what he's talking about. Dude, this is so high IQ. It's like, it's in the cloud, dude. So half y'all don't even know what I'm talking about. Half the time, I don't even know what I'm talking about. This too, it's beyond my own eye. So the MPD people in my head the altars are literally all just rapping and conversing in my head. And then I'm talking to you and you don't know which, you don't know which DID person you're talking to. So apparently Barry White has like 7,000 songs. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I don't know. We're going to skip singing Barry White. Cause I don't know the lyrics to all that, but there's only like five lyrics anyway. Get it together. Oh, yeah, get it together, baby. Right now, baby. Anyway. I was going somewhere with all that, and I forgot. But here we are. Hope y'all had a, a fun last 10 days. Welcome, everybody. This is Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis. The 50s have better hair. I don't like beehive. Beehive hairdos. Beehive hairdos. All the hairspray that it goes into your mom having a beehive hairdo. And by the way, I know your mom's trying to impress me when she wears her beehive hairdo. Tell your mom that I'm not interested, dude. I don't care that your mom is wearing a beehive hairdo. It's not like it's not gonna win me. It's not gonna seduce me. And everybody in the chat, everybody's mom is literally trying to seduce me with a beehive hairdo. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. And by the way, I'd written <laughs> notes for, uh, what's her name? Wonder Woman. Check out my Wonder Woman notes. So I didn't have my notepad that I take into the movies. So, <laughs> so we get to decipher this. So I made a makeshift human centipede notepad thing and don't you guys like that so yes i'm the what do you call these things i'm tired, I'm tired. sticky note i'm the sticky note human centipede organizer so we got it we get to decode that i don't even know what half these notes mean anymore which makes it more interesting so people are like, what does this guy do? Does he analyze movies? Yes, but he uh, analyzes the movie like five months later and then he doesn't remember what his notes are about and he can't read them because <laughs> he's writing them in the dark in the movie theater. Uh, and they're covered in uh, goober. Goober. What are, what are those candies? Goober stoppers? <laughs> you could just make up names that sound like candies and they probably could be or are. I don't know. A goober stopper? Uh, Mike and Ike's. 
Yum dums. Yum dums. Dude, that sounds like a candy. It's not, but it sounds like a candy. A yum dum. Remember, remember when we have sleepovers and like we would just like totally wig out on yum dums and then just crash from all the sugar. Nerds, all y'all, my boys in the chat and a few girls in the chat, y'all are named after candies. All this time you thought you were named after geeks with computers and shit. No, you're named after '80s candies. Remember when candies were good and fun? Were they always a bunch of corn syrup? Was I eating poison garbage in the 80s? Or, or were things better in the 80s? The Raisinets are the worst. What a ripoff. Raisinets. I want candy, dude. I don't want a quasi freaking vegetable. And that's what I see a raisin as. Raisins is like grandma's replacement for candy. Oh, have a raisin. Don't eat all that sugar. Well, dude, raisins are but nothing but sugar. So you're giving me basically uh, a midget prune. That's all a raisin is, is a homosexual midget prune. That's literally what a raisin is. And that's a fact, Jack. Twizzlers were fun in the movies. I ate a lot of Twizzlers over the years. I would get that big old 24 pack. Felt like a, uh, it feels like a, like a pack of fireworks. Like a big old pack of Roman candles. But it's a big old 25 pound pack of Twizzlers. And somebody always would get those nasty ass licorices. There's always one weirdo that thinks licorice are good. Oh, licorice are actually really good. Huh, really? You probably eat raisinets too, don't you? <laughs> Do you like boys? <laughs> right? You probably eat. There's no telling what you eat, dude. Probably the best overall is Twizzlers. Remember the the popcorn, the butter at the movie theater? Dude, you know, no telling how toxic that shit. Well, that's straight. That's straight up motor oil, whatever that butter is, dude. That's like they took a fourth of a cup of butter and they mixed it in a gallon of paint, but not the actual color paint, but like the, the gooey base of paint with a little bit of butter and then mixed it up and then they put like a cup of butter flavoring and then they heat it up to probably the equivalent of lava and then they you say uh, I would like butter and then they say how many glugs would you like one glug or do you would you like us to basically uh, coat the tub of popcorn in this industrial based epoxy <laughs> flavored that shit was epoxy dude that's what it was it's epoxy and if you get it right when they squirt it out that's that shit is lava level it is it is a cauldron so basically you're eating the Indian corn that the Indians tricked the honky man with covered in epoxy. That's it. Covered in boiling epoxy. And knowing some of you weirdos out there, you probably sprinkled your raisinets inside your epoxy based popcorn. All right. I lost my notes to Black Widow, but that's okay because I wasn't really going to repeat what I've already done for Black Widow in um, the video that we did on Rockfin and the video that I did on this channel. So hopefully you can enjoy those Black Widow because it's not about, oh, you watch Marvel. No, no. 
We're not watching Marvel movies because of Marvel movies. We're not watching a Disney movie because, oh, I love Disney movies. I love Marvel movies. <laughs> no, we're watching it because of just the repeated patterns of the crazy stuff they're putting in movies. Right? And, then, and, and then we've been here, we've been here doing that for a long time. Yes, uh, I fully advocate becoming a Luddite who only grows potatoes and eats roadkill. Remember remember Jewel telling the stories of who will save your soul? That she grew up in Alaska and her family would have to go find the roadkill to eat. I'm not joking, that's a, that's a famous Jewel story. Jewel eat ate roadkill. Which is a pretty damn good story for, that's a pretty good legend, like a backstory. What's Jewel's origin story? Did you know that chick had to eat flat deer, dude? Literally eat flat deer for years because they were poor. I'm not kidding you. That's the truth. Go look up Jewel. I remember this from years ago. Jewel would tell these stories about how they were so poor in Alaska that they would eat Roadkill, and there used to be a law that if I don't know if it's still law. It sounds like a crazy ass law, though. If you hit a thing, or if somebody else hit a thing, you can just go get it. <laughs> it's kind of like DoorDash beta version, right? Like, <laughs> hey, dude, I just hit, I just hit a chipmunk, and like, are you hungry or what? <laughs> Cause, come on over, dude. There's a chipmunk in the driveway. If you're if you if you're hungry right now, so who will save your soul? Uh, I didn't really care for Wonder Woman. I mean, I didn't why even watch the first one. So first of all, don't if you're expecting normie style movie reviews you came to the wrong channel we don't do that around here uh, we will eventually get to the movie reviews right now we're just we're just having fun dude are you against having fun i mean we kind of just have fun around here I mean, we did a 10 day mega journey to montana dude that was such a drive and uh you're you're what you're mad because we're gonna have fun Dude, we're here to have fun. You can't be serious all the time during a pandemic. Ice road truckers would have to. By the way, there's a lot of semis still frozen up there. So if you can figure out a way to melt that ice, there's probably five ten semis probably worth twenty thirty thousand dollars you could just go get them dude because they don't care anymore <laughs> the companies have no way to get those semis so if everybody's looking you want a little side cash a little income on the side there's literally like five or ten semis that you could just go get they're free totally free semis they're just kind of stuck in the middle of a giant danger zone. So, what happened? What are you talking about? What happened? What's up, Jethro? What's up? Okay. Shout out to all the awesome, famous, great mods who are now D-list e-celebs merely by being in the vicinity of a B-list e-celeb. Shout out. Welcome. We're, we're glad you're here. Uh, I am just basically educating everyone on the history of gang warfare, the history of musicals, the interplay between musicals and gang warfare via West Side Story, Sharks and the Jets, Crips and the Bloods. Um, and then we're going to talk about Jungle Cruise, doop, doop. Uh, The Rock. The, the Rock, that dude figured out how to, he just kind of watched Elvis and he's like, you know, how Elvis does this. And so The Rock was like, what can I do? And he's like, that's it. <laughs> he's like, this eyebrow goes up. That's my version of Elvis's thing. That's kind of genius, though. Right? I mean, 
we're gonna have to think up a um, a thing. Like I could do like Patrick Swayze, flare my nostrils. I can't do this because that's I could do the other side. Be like I'm reverse Elvis. I'm evil Elvis. I can't do that. So. The rock thing. Uh, we're going to talk about Jungle Cruise. Now, you think, why are you talking about Jungle Cruise? That is a uh, preposterous film to review. Uh, there's some pretty interesting things in this movie. And I'm not saying that you need to see this movie. I'm just simply relaying the facts, Jack. And we are also going to talk about Wonder Woman 1984, which uh, I did take extensive notes upon. Six, five months ago, whenever it was, forgot to do the review, and then I found my notes. We're going to talk about Shyamalan Ding Dong's old. I'm not saying Shyamalan is old, although he does look older, but he's not old. But he made a movie called Old, and it was, I liked it. I think it had a good message. Uh, I figured it out pretty good with my Shyamalans now. Shyamalan gets a lot of hate. A lot of people hate. I, I don't actually hate Shyamalan movies. I actually like. I actually like most of them. All right, so uh, everybody can hate on me at that point. But hey, I like what I like, and I have my reasons. And I can recognize sometimes a, mo a movie is dumb, but has an element to it that I like. Uh, now Shyamalan did some really interesting things in old with the camera work. I mean, there was like some really bizarre cameras. I mean, like half the movie is really weird camera angles. So he's doing some interesting things, right? It's not all, um, yes. I mean, it's, he's a commercial filmmaker, a pop filmmaker, but, um, uh, this movie, which we'll get to in a minute, actually has a good message. And I think the people in this audience can understand what I mean when I say that this movie has a good message. And we'll talk about that. And then what's the other one? Uh, oh, we're not going to talk about Black Widow in depth except to kind of review the illegals, KGB illegal stuff that Mark Hackard has done so many translations on. I keep telling Mark, dude, you got to make this into a book. This is like awesome uh, you know book level material here so maybe one day he'll make it into a book i think he 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 ought to uh fascinating stuff let's see no i already did that one so let's see I'm trying to well, yeah we'll go through uh some of mark's analysis and you're going to notice the parallels to the americans right FX show we've done I think two podcasts on the Americans excellent show one of the best TV shows of all time actually um, adult themes I'm not trying to say that everybody is ready for that but yeah the new 007 delayed for like two years it kind of looks pretty um, crucked if you know what I mean <laughs> cruckhold uh, 007 got a got yeah crook holded it looks like but maybe not maybe uh, that's just how the trailer appears I don't know so <sighs> everything is everything's just gonna be ruined I guess basically and what was the other movie we wanted to do Joan Cruz Wonder Woman illegals in relation to Black Widow which I didn't get to get to last time and then old all right so let's get into this thank you for that super chat we will read the super chats out here in a moment remember to support this show podcast sponsors via the super chats by the way got some cool news been talking to some pretty big name musician people not the beatles i don't know if you've ever heard of them John Ringo, Paul, Paul McCartney, John Ringo, Bobby 
Bob is the beetle that you've never heard of. <laughs> I'm just joking, there's no Bobby Beetle. The Rolling Stones. <laughs> Mick Jagger. Not funny. No, not going to be talking to Mick Jagger. I have been talking to a pretty prominent musician. Very cool dude. Not Wicked Face, another prominent musician. So we may have a cool interview lined up soon, dude. And uh, I think you guys are going to be you're gonna be surprised. It's not Miles Davis. It's not Maynard Ferguson. <laughs> it's not Stuart Copeland. It's not Stung or Stang. It's not Flea. It's not... Philip Glass. <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's not Criss Cross. I know all you guys are like, it's Criss Cross, dude. He has been chatting with with Criss Cross. It's not Zub. Nah, no, dude. This I'm talking like this is bigger name person. Now he said he'll do an interview, but we don't know yet. It's totally Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> Times have changed. That's insane. It's been so long. Mama, I'm coming home. It is not Ozzy Osbourne and Mama, I'm not coming home, dude. I have moved out. I'm not coming home. You think I'm going to come home at age 25 where I'm at now? <laughs> Dude, y'all thought y'all believed it. Y'all thought I was 25. Psych. I'm 26, dude. It's not Kiss. It's not Prince either. It's not David Lee Roth. Anyway, y'all gonna go all night with this. Uh, nobody has guessed it. You should be. I mean, dude, think about people that are kind of in our sphere of people, right? And by the way, we got an, another famous person hobnobbing with freaking e celebs, dude. Uh, coming out of the the skating sphere, we will have a a skater coming on. No, it's not Tony Squawk or whatever his name is. It's not Tony Braxton. It's not Aaliyah. <laughs> it's not R. Kelly. <laughs> it's not Britney Spears. It's not Vanilla Ice. What it's like having a Roni. <laughs> what does that even mean? I've literally to this day, I've never known what the heck Vanilla Ice is talking about. What it's like having a Roni. Yes, it's Tupac. It's not a rapper, dude. We are talking uh, a cool dude from the synth world. Synth world. Beep, burp. From the synth world, dude. Not a rapper. And uh, skateboarder. You probably already figured that one out. It's your boy Wrecking Ball, except it's not Wrecking Ball. It's Wrecking Ball, which fools everybody because he subtly hid the R. And so you do a double take and you're like, wait a minute, that dude left the R out. It's Wrecking Ball. He just psyoped me. He psyoped me to take a double take on his name. Now I know that dude's name because he psyoped me to misspell it. Genius, bro. So yeah, your boy Weckin' Ball. Uh, We're going to be having a chat soon. That's going to be fun. And then... No, it's Moby. <laughs> uh, it's not Moby and it's not... There was a funny... Uh, I did meet Jack White, but it's not Jack White. Uh, I met Jack White in an airport. He was right behind me in first class. Not joking. Uh, and then I was like... So, dude, that's Jack White by me. <laughs> so, when we got off the plane, I was like, Hey, dude, I've listened to your music for a long time. I like your music. I actually do. Like the rock on tours. 
because Jack White is in Nashville, if you don't know. So yeah, I got to, so he was like, hey, good to meet you. Thank you. Appreciate your kind words. I said, I happen to have a copy of a book called Esoteric Hollywood, maybe. And he was like, yeah, thank you, man. I appreciate that. So uh, I shared that on Twitter back in January of last year. So that's, you can, you can all go verify that. So I wonder if Jack White ever read Esoteric Hollywood. Interesting. Interesting to know. I also left a copy for Bill Murray, too. I went to a restaurant that Bill Murray owned. He wasn't there, obviously, but I got to leave Bill Murray a copy of Esoteric Hollywood. So. Let's get into Jungle Cruise. Now, uh, Jungle Cruise... One, first of all, I'm just going to say flat out what they're doing. All this movie is is a, an attempt to have Pirates of the Caribbean repeated. They're like, let's take Pirates of the Caribbean and redo that and pick the ride. Okay, let's do Jungle Cruise. And the worst of all the Disney rides is that stupid ass. It may be Jungle Cruise. Whatever it's it's the worst of all, literally the worst. No, there's two or three that are the worst. But one of the top two worst is that stupid ass Chiquita banana supported. It's a Monsanto. I'm not joking. A Monsanto sponsored tour. And you float around on that boat and they show you the GMO bananas. I'm not kidding. It's like this is we are in the dystopia now. Like, wow. And they're literally showing you float around and they're showing you. GMO bananas in the future box city where they're going to grow your GMO plants, you know, in your communist high rise that you're going to live in, right? Like Judge Dredd or whatever. Um, I don't remember the name of that ride. I'm sure you guys know which ride I'm talking about. It's in Epcot. It's, it's not in Disney Magic Kingdom. It's over in epcot and it's the chiquita banana thing and I, I think isn't jungle cruise over in that area too or jungle cruise might be in animal kingdom i don't remember whatever uh but this movie so that you'll there's this goddess theme keeps popping up and you have to pay attention because again, you're going to, you'll get caught up in all the goofy gags and whatnot. And, and it's just really just ripping off Indiana Jones. It's a bunch of gags from Indiana Jones and it's a bunch of, let's just redo Pirates of the Caribbean. Now I actually think Pirates of the Caribbean is good trilogy, not all these other terrible ones, but I, like that's probably the last decent thing that Disney put out that I can recall. Um, and it was before everything was so woke, you know what I'm saying? So, and dude, Jungle Cruise is so woke. It's like what? But let's get into the symbolism of it. So I'm not gonna go too deep into this because what's really crucial is that you have this, you know, Amazon, uh, you know, river snake thing, right? There's a secret of immortality on the jungle cruise trip that the conquistadors the conquistadors had discovered so what's interesting is that disney is clearly going against catholicism now i don't really care about roman catholicism as everybody knows but from their vantage point the point is to just take that as like the representative of Christianity and oh look how evil right the the conquistadors right they were just uh terrible colonialists who just trampled and killed everyone and all they wanted was gold there's, I'm sure there's some truth to that <laughs> I don't think all the con conquistadors the conquistadors were all a uh, good guys certainly not saying that however I don't think the motivations of Disney are to give a legitimate and fair historical critique of the conquistadors and the Spanish Inquisition. No, uh, their job is to basically picture it as 
patriarchal religion. So what's amazing is that in this movie, it's the patriarchy and the four cursed conquistadors. And yes, they're cursed. So the Catholic, the Christian missionary conquistadors are cursed. They have the curse of death. They are essentially stuck to the jungle. They're, they're embodied. They can't live a free life. And if you watch the movie, you'll know what I'm getting at here. They're, they're literally like trapped at the river. So they can't lose, they can't leave side of the river or they'll, or else they get the vines yanked them back and they're cursed in different ways. Like one of them is, uh, a bunch of beehives. The other one is a bunch of mud. The other one is a bunch of snakes, <laughs> which is clearly just mimicking pirates of the Caribbean where, you know, there's, uh, Captain, what's his name? I don't even remember, right? Not Jack Sparrow, but the 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 um, squid face dude, whatever his name is. Anyway, Captain Squiddle Squiddle D. So they're just ripping all that off. And the weird part was that I totally wasn't expecting anything bizarre or esoteric. I thought it was going to be a retarded, you know, Disney film. And so then Emily Blunt's character is this feminist, literally, in the 19 teens or whenever this is, right around the time of World War One or so. And her brother is a Skittles man, and he makes that clear right away. So she's a feminist Skittles rights pro-activist person in 1910. Yeah, that's very believable. <laughs> uh, and they go on this treasure hunting journey because they're like, Nash it's, it's National Treasure meets Pirates of the Caribbean. That's what it is. So she's like feminist Nick Cage, basically. And they're a treasure hunting family. They're rich. They have the money to, you know, foster these tours. They float down the, the river. The Rock is a con man. And the interesting thing that we find out, spoiler alert, The Rock was one of the conquistadors. El Rocco <laughs> conquistador. He was one of the conquistadors. The difference being, get this. This is the crazy part. For some reason, The Rock escapes the curse because he didn't go along with the conquistadors in killing the tribes people to get the secret of immortality, which is from a tree of life, a Kabbalistic tree of life, by the way. So The Rock turned on his captain from the conquistadors, killed the captain. He still got cursed, but his curse wasn't as bad. So the rock basically is, he's still cursed. Like he can walk around and do stuff. And he eventually traps his conquistador friends who are trying to get him. Although you can't kill anybody because when you kill them, they just come back and they're basically stuck at the river, the Amazon river, whatever. So, the Rock builds a boat and a city. And he sets up a whole new little kind of enclave civilization. And he secretly is spending all these years trying to find the hidden tree that they hid. Right? So the conquistadors did find the tree and they knew where it was because they raped and pillaged the land of the tribes, people who knew the secrets. And so then the conquistador is turned into a snake. Literally, he's a snake dude. And he has the serpentine secrets, but he's stuck in a cave. So the son of the Kaiser, who is basically the, you know, the German guy who's going to 
initiate. I think we're supposed to think this is going to be World War One, right? So the Kaiser or the Kaiser Jr., he also wants the secret to immortality. And he knows that you have to do a ritual with the serpent uh, to give the serpent the water of the jungle. And then they do this, and this allows the serpent cursed Conquistador to get free. Because they want to they want to get free of the curse, right? And you need the tree of life to get free of the curse. So the curse of death, perpetual death, requires healing from the tree of life. But the Catholics stole all of this from the indigenous people. So the real religion is an indigenous religion that worships Mother Earth the tree of life, the female life force. And so guess what though? So what the rock does is build a boat that he sails as a, um, he's like a tour guide. So here's, hence the jungle cruise. So he's this tour guy, but it, the comedy element comes in because he's a con man. And so he's a, a good con man because he's been alive for 400 years and he's learned human nature. And so he tricks everybody. Ah, but you see Emily Blunt is the, uh, clever feminist who outsmarts outwits and out braveries him and so they begin to develop a uh, love affair an attraction her brother also seems to have an attraction for the rock and in fact one of the things I've never seen was a movie geared towards young people where the brother has a discussion about a lot of Skittles things with The Rock. And it's really weird and it's bizarre in the middle of the movie out of nowhere. So it was just like, what? Anyway, I mean, it's just, this is out there, dude. This is like the, the plot is, is this just, this is just so out there. Anyway, so long story short, yes, they find the, uh, the tree of life, but the God, the, but the rock dedicates his ship to the goddess. And so it becomes this arc that takes the, his feminist bride to the tree of life and they find salvation and the removal of the curse of death. And the religions are all fake because by the way, the rock has actually hired people to act like they're in cannibal tribes. That's in there, but it's all fake as part of his kind of joke con that he does when he does the jungle cruise. And then he, 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 he cons people because he pretends that he's saving them from these cannibals. And then they kind of offer him more money on the cruise, all of which actually that part was kind of funny, but, um, in reality, what's going on is that religion is a deception because all the religions that you see are actually masks for the perennial religion of the tree of life, tree of gnosis, which removes the curse via the goddess spirit. Now, this is relevant because this is going to come up in Wonder Woman as well. Because Wonder Woman's like, hey, she's a kind of a goddess, dude. She's literally from like the, I don't know, goddess planet. I don't care about this mythology per se, but. That's what's going on with Wonder Woman. And, and again, it, it's just, I wasn't expecting The Rock to pray to his ship named the goddess in whatever Amazonian language he says this. And then Emily Blunt overhears him praying to the goddess. And he's like, oh, yeah. He's like, I pray to the goddess, right? So he's not Catholic anymore. He's moved into a new religion. Emily Blunt becomes his new partner. And she's a total feminist, where right? she identifies as such. So it's just very, it's so like blatant what the movies are about. So Christianity is fake. It's all a scam. It borrowed everything from indigenous religions. Are you serious? I mean, who can if people be this stupid to think that, like, as if there's one indigenous religion? There's not one indigenous religion. Like there's not, there's no perennial, uh, you know, skeletal religion that all the religions are 
coming from except for what you read in Genesis. You see, if you want to say there is a perennial religion, yeah, it's what's mentioned in Genesis, right? So anyway, so that's what was was going on in that movie. It was very subversive, uh, openly so, pretty crazy. Um, somebody asked me the other day, what's the last good movie you saw? Uh, old was okay, but really the best good movie that's, that I keep thinking about over and over is La Femme Nikita. I mean, that was great. And I didn't expect it to be that good. And I'm just kind of like, why didn't I ever watch this one of the best spy movies. I don't know how I missed it, but, and then I realized, wait a minute, point of no return with Bridget Fonda is the same movie. And then I realized I looked it up. Yes, it is. So the, they just literally remade for American audiences, a totally shit version of Luke Besson's excellent movie, La Femme Nikita. And it's so dumb. Like, it's the same movie, almost like a probably a shot for shot same movie, but it's just awful. La Femme Nikita. It is one of the most one of the most famous French films by Luc Besson, as in Luc Besson of Fifth Element, The Professional, Lucy, The Messenger. Mila Jovovich, that Luke Besson. Uh, and he seems to either make a really good movie or a just god-awful movie. I mean, he he really is a polarizing filmmaker. <laughs> They're either unbearably bad or they are really good. So... But as I said, yes, I actually brought up uh, La Femme Nikita in the last installment of Jalex Hone's show, where we were talking about MKUltra. Uh, I brought it up with uh, Sean Atwood, if you remember. Because you're watching La Femme Nikita and you're like, wait a minute. <laughs> so she is a crackhead. She's, she's a like a straight up psycho crackhead, dude. And she kills a cop, and then she ends up in jail. And the Secret Service come to her, and they're like, we like your skill set. <laughs> we like the way you think and act. Uh, you are very good at killing people and being psychotic. What we want to do is channel your energies into working for the state. We think you would be a great government assassin. And so the more that I read about the serial killers and the more that I've uncovered more and more programs where uh, deviants were recruited. I just covered this in the most recent Rockfin talk about the Dr. John Gittinger and the origins of the personality assessment system, the PAS. And uh, Dr. John Gittinger's work was utilized for many years. It's hallowed by different people for the thousands of different personality profiles that he came up with uh, for the purpose of being able to compromise people. And he was really interested in deviants and utilizing deviants by the state. So now we're starting to understand what's really going on, how the world is really run, you see. You know? Jeff Stein, Efri operations so you're watching La Femme Nikita and you're they bring in this woman who is the state madam I mean she's the madam for the government <laughs> who has the stable of sex operatives okay so they're literally turning Nikita in into a honey trap killer and they train her in life skills it's like we're gonna give you your, all these life skills so that you can uh, you know, live day to day and you're going to break from your crack or heroin addiction or whatever she was addicted to. Uh, and you're going to assassinate the people when we tell you to. So they train her in black belt. She takes her MMA classes, her BJJ. She goes to Gr Gracie Academy. Uh, and then she is trained in sniper shooting and she 
has a relationship, but the irony is that her relationship is the cover for uh, her to do these things. So when she's out on her honeymoon, they, right, they give her the assignment to, <laughs> from her honeymoon suite bathroom, uh, sniper shoot some organized crime guy uh, in in Venice, uh, which I mean, just from a filming film perspective, those scenes are excellent. I mean, they're the the intensity, the on your edge of the seat where she's trying to assassinate a person while she's having an argument with her hunt for with her husband, <laughs> her fiance. It's just excellent, right? I mean, it's like it's Hitchcock level stuff in terms of filmmaking. So. Again, if you've not seen La Femme Nikita, it's excellent, excellent movie. Now, the other thing about this is the the weirdness of the French cinema styles and the use of the music is so bizarre in this movie. There's really weird music in this movie. But if you would like a good insight into government assassins, I mean, Epstein level stuff in a movie a long time ago this movie came out like 93 or something 92 and it's like wait a minute these movies already told us the government has like government trained madams and 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 in john marx's essay on john gittinger he says yeah they had a stable of hoes a stable of thoughts ready and willing to obey Uncle Sam's orders, baby. Yeah, I don't even know how to describe the, the music in La Femme de Quille. It's so weird and quirky and totally doesn't fit this mind-controlled assassin movie. I mean, this is a this is an MK Ultra movie with, like, funk jazz beats. <laughs> it's so weird, but... It's, it's one of my favorite spy movies now. It's up in... The, it's like it's moved up to like... Dude, that, that's sort of a great spy movie. Uh, Bridget Fonda, American version, is awful, dude. It is terrible. Do not waste your time with that. Unless you're looking for a comparison of just terrible to good. And it's just dumb, dude. The, now, by the way, there's also a TV show. I've never watched that. It was 90s, so it's got 90s cheese. I tried to watch it, but I was like, no, it's like, uh, and then there was a more recent mid two thousands version of La Femme Nikita. So they've done this like four or five times. It's it's a a popular story. But I'm just thinking about how you know these movies were showing us honey traps like all the whole time. So why why are we surprised when the F Stein Jeffrey stuff comes out? It's like, do this was in how many movies? And and don't you like the the Pizarpal throne? The Pizarpal love seat. I mean, what better love seat could you have for movie analysis? It's pretty comfortable too, and it's fuzzy. It feels, I mean, it legitimately feels like like if Dolomite was gonna review movies, this is what he would sit in. It's all, it's like one tier below a throne that Dolomite would have. Uh, by the way, uh, we're going to get a new camera. So I bought a new camera. And it took Amazon a month to refund the money because wouldn't you know, I bought the Canon camera that doesn't live stream. So I had to send it back. And so, uh, yes, uh, we should be... We should be up to, I'm a little jealous of little AIDS because he beat us to the high quality live streaming. And I bought a camera last year, as everyone knows, and it was a thousand dollars Nikon. I was very proud of it. And within three months it broke. So I'm not very happy with Nikon. Uh, um, you and your Jap Japanime people and your Nippons can go, you can kiss my nip my nipple. The Nippon, uh, Nikon, Nikon Nippon can kiss my nipple because your thousand dollar camera broke within three months. Uh, so I guess I'm gonna have to get a Canon. And then when I bought the Canon, it doesn't live stream. And it's why are they making this stuff? Do you know there's all these rules in the EU? How dumb is this? 
there's laws in the e that cameras won't record over 20 minutes or 30 minutes. What? This is so dumb. Like, talk about irrational bureaucracy. So, I mean, I have my critiques of libertarianism, as you know, but dudes, come on, man. So these, some of these state laws, are, are, dude, ugh, they're so dumb, dude. And they're obviously just to uh, stifle innovation, progress, obviously. Why would you make a camera that will not record more than 20 minutes? This is so dumb. I mean, it's just like the most irrational, ridiculous. And then why are you making a thousand dollar camera that breaks in three months, Nikon? You have no honor. All right. So Wonder Woman, obviously the goddess here. What's her planet? Doesn't she come from like, isn't it, doesn't it hint at Greek goddesses or something? Hera, this kind of stuff. If I remember, because at the beginning of this Wonder Woman, it does have that theme. And of course it's got to have, oh, you can accomplish anything. Don't let the evil patriarchy tell you that you can't go be a government hooker or assassin. I mean, uh, listen, all you, all you ambitious young girls out there, don't you want to be La Femme Nikita? Don't you want to be a government assassin? It's so glamorous to uh, give your life for, it's kind of like that satire video I did like five, six years ago. I actually thought it was a pretty, pretty good satire, but I don't know what happened. Maybe I'll upload it to Rockfin. Nobody got it. Nobody liked it. It got like just destroyed. But it was a drill sergeant telling people, preparing them for battle, but that they were going to die for Subway and McDonald's and that you have a duty to die for Subway. I thought that was like a genius idea for a skit, but uh, apparently no one else did. <laughs> so fair enough. It got like a thousand views. I mean, even back when I was getting way more than a thousand views, but I mean, am I wrong? That's kind of, Isn't that funny? I feel like I kind of know what's funny. A drill sergeant telling you to die for Subway? I mean, that just sounds funny. I don't know. And isn't that really what it would be to go into the military? It's like, yes, I want to die for Skittles. I want to die for McDonald's and Subway and Pepsi. That's, uh, I mean, Pepsis are so good. Raisinets are so good glugs of movie butter that's what i want to die for i want to die for the epoxy that they give me in my movie popcorn so uh wonder woman 1984 interesting choice of years this is a another weird multi-layered inversion right where there's going to be some truths here even like conspiracy level truths that are going to what is up with my freaking thick ass boomer hair, dude? I cannot fix my hair. I'm gonna have to get a flat top or something, right? I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna be Iceman Val Kilmer from Top Gun. That's a little better, but I mean, I look like a. This is like the hair of a preppy douchebag in an '80s teen movie, like this kind of quaffed and feathered thing like i'm probably pulling up in uh a bmw right now and i'm taking the girl that you like and then uh, i look over at you and flip you off and laugh that's this hairdo right totally but now the rest of me is not that i don't i'm not sure what's going on with this weird neck beard thing this is not accurate but whatever um, <clears throat> all right, so let's try to break this down. So Wonder Woman 1984 is set during Cold War. And it's going to be a critique of capitalism and consumerism, of all things. 
So remember, you've got Fortune 100 companies making movies against capitalism and critiquing consumerism. The movies are consumerism. It's just like, right. And then at the same time, there's almost these like Antichrist themes in this movie that the goddess will save us from Antichrist because Antichrist is this patriarchal male thing. So I think what we're getting in the movies is a pattern of phallo logos stuff, Catholicism, Jesus, patriarchy, logos, phallo logos, father. These archetypes, okay? I'm not saying that it's a Gnostic thing. I'm just saying that the way that the symbols are used in the films for the propaganda is just concerned with taking all of those archetypes that I just listed, portraying those as the fascist, controlling, big brother, Apollonian religion, reason, logic religion that's controlling you versus the feminine goddess Isis Dionysian abandoned Saturnalian freedom giving into the passions freedom but what is more consumerist than the chicks dude <laughs> I mean right so, come on, like that, first of all, it doesn't make sense, but is it actually the case that the goddess and the feminine principle are going to save us from the masculine antichrist force? I mean, it's just, what? This is so weird, dude. It's so... Like the mind of the, like, what are the people thinking who are coming up? And I, you think I'm joking. I'm not joking. Like that, that's, think of another movie like this, like Jupiter Ascending. This was the same plot, right? So you got Wachowskis and then Mila Kunis is that normal chick I actually wrote an essay on Jupiter ascending because it was so like goddess Gnostic stuff right and that's what's going on here same idea another example of this go go watch Jupiter ascending not because of it's a great movie but because of what I'm saying like it proves this point so the idea is that so on one level the movie is going to critique consumer culture pop culture that everything has a price and I do actually will give this movie interesting credit for the accuracy of how much 80s stuff is going on. And it, it, a cert, it's almost like an acid trip in the 80s. I'm not joking. Like there's just really weird camera angles and stuff that they do. And, and it's just like, whoa, dude. It's like a dream state. Uh, now, I do have to say Kristen Wiig's character, when it turns into this CGI cougar it is just dumb and, and is that's terrible but everything before that <laughs> till that last the last third of the movie is not very good the first two thirds actually again i'm not recommending this movie but i am impressed with the creativity and the the surreal aspect it's like an 80s dream sequence i don't know how else to describe it uh, I can't think of any other movie like this. I mean, yes, it's kind of like elements of Donnie. You know how Donnie Darko is an interesting kind of dreamy 80s experience? It's kind of like that. Uh, what else? Dreamy. A uh, Stranger Things to a degree is, a you know, that 80s homage kind of thing. So... I'm just having to, I have to admit that is interesting. I, th I think the, the art direction and the style for the first two thirds of the movie are pretty impressive. Um, it's pretty neat. Everything else, garbage, dude, <laughs> like total garbage. Although I do think Gal Gadot looks kind of like Jamie. So Gal Gadot and Jamie are 
very similar and they both look good so that's a comment a compliment for Jamie now we're going to get the people saying that Gal Gadot is a MTF <laughs> and then people are going to say Jamie is an MTF and exposed dude exposed remember you can of course support us via super chats and I will be your little dancing monkey touch the monkey touch him if you super chat I become your dancing monkey and you can touch the monkey so everything has a price men as we see obviously they're all abusive dude men are so mean especially me the whole internet has figured out I am really mean right the Catholics the Protestants their feelings are very hurt um, and I'm very mean so I'm like I'm like their abusive stepdad and the Catholics and the Protestants are like two, uh, they're two dirty butt stepchildren who've been eating candy all day. And I come in drinking that sauce and I, I'm the abusive mean stepdaddy to these dirty butt stepchildren. I mean, they've got dirty ass diapers, dude. They've been rolling around outside the trailer in the dirt all day. And when I when when Papa comes home after hitting the sauce, the poor stepchildren get a spanking. <laughs> I, I stole all of that from. That's basically just a total Theo Vaughn ripoff type of thing. So, <laughs> like, where did you? All that stepchildren jokes are. are that's all Theo Vaughn stuff. So. I stole all that, but it's still funny. Um, the men are abusive. Let's see. Nickelodeon. What does that mean? Something about American Gladiators. The movie reminded Maybe American Gladiators comes up in it. And that's funny because we always joke about American Gladiators on here. We used, to, we used to do boiler rooms, right? The whole boiler room was about making fun of American Gladiators. Storm and ice and rock and all those weird, like, Remember the women who had muscles as big as the dude? American Gladiators. <laughs> what? This is so weird. Um, so the company, they talk about Black Gold, which is this oil corporation. So the bad guy is this oil tycoon. And there's this theme of consumption. We're bad, we consume oil. We're bad because we're consuming all this pop culture garbage. When it's the system who promotes consumerism to control everybody. And so they, they give you this false dialectic of, oh, you see, you can either be this bad for the planet consumer or you can have total uh, like Soviet green corporate government. So which, which one do you want? That, that's all there is. <laughs> you can have Great Reset or you can have like, uh, you know, oil, corpor oil corporation consumerism, consumerism, which do you want? That's it. There's all, that's only two options. Literally, there's nothing else. No, no other options. That's all there is. There is an anti pop pop message in this. Clearly, the savior of everyone and everybody in the, is is the goddess. It is the woman. It is the incarnated goddess figure in Wonder Woman, Gal Gadot. Gal Gadot is the Gnostic goddess archetype. We even have reference to Minerva. So she's kind of a Pallas Athene figure as well. So she's Athena. She's Minerva. She is fighting the entire movie this oil tycoon who it's not Donald Trump but it's it has like Trump-esque things and it's just so absurd like I'm guessing they thought you know like it would be Hillary or that we would be in this kind of a situation and so it would just sort of reinforce the idea, I guess, that we need... Because remember, normies think that presidents run shit, right? So the normies think that 
President Hillary would like really get shit done for progressives, and we would like we would really like if we could just get rid of bald wig, or excuse me, blonde wig wearing so-called conservative tycoons, we'd be free. I mean, it, I know that sounds so dumb, but that's literally the level at the, of the programming in this. But at the same time, the weird thing about this movie is that it's got this really low-level, dumb programming, and then it's got this weird, more sophisticated layer of programming. It's, 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 it's strange. Uh, waiting for Godot. Get it? Gal Godot. I don't know what my... I had some joke there, but... Something to do with <laughs> fighting the phallus and waiting for Godot. I don't know. Um, Envy. Envy. Hobo Envy. No idea what Hobo Envy is, but it sounds great. That that sounds like something that slipped through the tracks, like, through, through the cracks. Like that could have been Hobo Envy. <laughs> what? <laughs> We make a lot of jokes about hobos because they seem to pop up in all these movies. I don't know what, but I don't know what uh, envious hobo is. I don't know what they're in. So, um, but it sounds awesome. Male. French. I can't. That's why you got to do the analysis right away, right? I have no idea what these notes mean. French crime. Alistair. Oh, Alice. So there's a Crowley reference. It appears. That's probably the the deeper level with this kind of stuff is probably Crowleyan. Because I'm not saying Crowleyanism is true, but it is a, a Gnostic satanic system that does tend to kind of attract people with IQs a little higher than normies. I mean, the whole system is insane, but um, I, I do think they throw in these references to Crowley, Alistair, this kind of stuff. So the son, I think, of the tycoon who's mad at the tycoon is named Alistair. Um, is the tycoon representing the, the father figure, the god the father? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and so he's uh, organized some kind of Ponzi scheme. That's interesting. Uh, Crystal Skulls comes up in this, which is weird. Um, there's a dream stone. They mention the moon mission. Fake as... Oh, so... This is just a thought I had where it's like... The way they describe the moon mission... In in the setting of this comic book movie... It just made me think about how... If you look at the pictures of them playing golf on the moon... I mean, that's kind of cartoonish... Kind of like a comic book. I don't know. That was my thought when I was watching the movie. So I don't remember what the point of Crystal Skulls was, but yeah, the villain is clearly Trump esque. So as I'm watching the movie, there's more elements that are, oh, this is like the bad guy's Trump. I was uh, really creative there. Um, universal, universal elements. So that there was like references to like elemental spirits and forces. Invoking and controlling them through speaking truth to power. I, I mean, I think it was supposed to be the idea is like if if you're a young girl, Wonder Woman is your archetype. Fight Donald Trump and speak truth to power. I mean, it was like what? And so I don't know what universal elements. So I think that has to do with the mythology of this. Uh, DC world I don't know I hate I don't care about this comic book crap but it does the, the, so in Marvel you have the infinity gauntlet right which Thanos uh, you know snaps his fingers and kills half of the universe and in in the DC universe it's universal elements I don't know I think that's just referring to like archetypal forces tapping into them controlling them um, the USSR comes into play. There ends up being this oil war. Uh, civilization is going to collapse. And then there's something to do with the God of Lies, which is related to the obelisk in DC. That's bizarre. And then it implies that the Soviet embassy 
has a connection with the I think he has doesn't even have like a weird wig like a Trump wig it's implying Trump Soviet Russia collusion I'm not joking that's what's implied in this movie it's like it's so it's so I mean and they, do these people not know that Russia gate collapsed like 16 times over literally nothing to it it's all fake all came out it it collapsed like 10 16 times dude and by the way i called that at the very instance that it came out that it was fake and i was right about everything i said about all of that no collusion it's gonna be wonderful really very wonderful you think i think no collusion. Uh, nukes. So they're going to set off nukes. It's a Cold War alternate. It's an alternate history if the Soviets had teamed up with the president, who at that time is a Trump-Reagan composite. Basically, it's Trump-Reagan is what it is. Uh, he takes over the White House and the presidency. Um, then there's this message that men enslave the Amazonian women. So, so all women everywhere are the Amazonian women who have been <laughs> enslaved by men. I mean, this is so dumb, dude. Uh, and then their their goddess, the Wonder Woman. Amazonian people on her planet, their goddess girl, Asteria, she died for their salvation to be free. So the female archetype dies for the liberation of the women. That's the message of this movie. Wonder Woman is a self-sacrificial goddess archetype who dies to free everyone from the Reagan, Putin, Trump, evil <laughs> composite character that is completely made up. And... Yeah, so that's, I can't even read my other notes, but that's basically what is going on. But it does mention these weird things like Reagan, Star Wars Defense Initiative, Cold War Chaos, the new civilization that will all rise out of the Cold War Chaos will be this third way feminized global world order. Didn't we just hear Boris Johnson or, or one of those goobers saying that the Great Reset will be a feminist New World Order. I'm not joking. It was either Blair or uh, came out from his cave or B Boris Johnson. Somebody like three weeks ago was literally saying the Great Reset will be uh, at the installation of a feminist New World Order. It's like, whoa, dude. You guys realize we are in total bonkers land, dude. It is like... Every day is just a circus, man. We are in a circus. We live in a freaking... We live in a comic book. The reality is a comic book. Reality is a Bond novel meets comic book. Meets Bozo. Now, we did. I, I did mention, you know, there's some interesting parallels between... Lafin Nikita and the illegals program. So there's one of uh, Mark's excellent articles on illegals. Here's another excellent article on the illegals. And I was watching the Americans at the time. Mark was writing all these these great essays and translations. I was like, man, this is just fascinating. This stuff is so, uh, like, it's it's amazing to me that. You have so many, such a, a popular genre like spy movies. And spy movies are full of all kinds of conspiracies that are real. And everybody should kind of maybe know that people who write screenplays are oftentimes former spies or 
I mean, this is a classic thing in British intelligence. And so why do we think that it's weird when this stuff comes out? It's all in freaking movies, dude. So, I mean, again, I, like when I went to see Black Widow and I'm sitting there and it's like the movie opens with child trafficking, if you know what I mean. It's like, what? So there are orphans being trafficked into a government program run by, I think he's supposed to be a Soviet dude, but they even show him with, they even show him with Bill. What? <laughs> I mean, and they're, so they're training these orphan chicks, AKA Scarlet to be what they call black widows who are these, uh, sleeper cell assassin spy revolutionaries blah, blah blah and then it turns out that she's placed it says it's in the movie she's in a Soviet illegals program household <laughs> that's crazy dude but now what is the real story of this well the illegals were directorate S and that was the KGB's uh, most skilled deep cover operatives and they were so skilled at this that they would basically create little fake cities if you watch the americans philip and elizabeth meet they're they're put in this little fake village community that's supposed to be america and so they learn everything about like christmas and pop culture and the music and the style and the dress and just everything to do with it so that they can come over here be here for many years and then at the right time, when that cover has been really established, do whatever operations they, they're asked to do. And those are real things. Those are real, fascinating, real programs, amazing, real stories. Now, when you watch The Americans, obviously this is a composite. Okay, you can't be cooking bake sale brownies, running off and murdering some dude and cutting up the body and then running off to sniper somebody from the top of a Eiffel Tower from the top of the state Empire State Building then running off the next day to bury a body and then running off the next day to sleep with a senator to compromise I mean you, there's no way right? it's just the way that the Americans works is like it's obviously like 20 different people compacted into Philip and Elizabeth but if you haven't heard the excellent interviews that uh, Mark and I did because Mark knows a tremendous amount about this area um, his, you could say his specialty is in right um, KGB writings, uh, defectors, their stories, and the illegals. And so Director S was the Ill illegals directorate. It was the KGB's first chief directorate for intelligence. And we, uh, Mark, uncovered a an account from one of the KGB lieutenant generals, Vadim Kuprachenko. And this is during the 70s, March of 74. Uh, and he was un directly under uh, Yuri Andropov, right? So Yuri Andropov, KGB chairman at the time. And let's get into, so uh, I was invited to Andropov's office. He says, he shook my hand and proposed that I sit down. His handshake was soft and he had a large, but his hands were large and warm. The traditional tea with lemongrass holders was brought in. And Drapa began to use an, uh, an, an became used to economizing time and that of his interlocutor. He therefore immediately began with the topic. We deliberated, and we decided to appoint you deputy chief of intelligence for Director S. The illegals. For this was a completely unexpected turn of events. In fact, this was not his previous line of work. Uh, in short, you have no choice. It is the KGB's final decision. You will return to Cairo, uh, pass on your cases. In a month, you will begin your work. So Kurpachenko would be the head of the illegals. Upon returning from Cairo, I waited for a long time to meet with Brezhnev. The visit of the Secretary General took place in 1974 in April. Um, we had a long conversation. We told jokes, blah, blah, blah. And it said... Illegals intelligence is special work. These are the most stoic, brave, and strong people that we have. They do not have weaknesses. They do not have defects. The party values this very 
uh, intensely for the, the collective, and I have been entrusted with this great task. So he says, don't even think about refusing this position. You must take it. There's no debate. Uh, so over the next five years in this new position, Kurpachenko said that this time flew by. Um, he learned all he could, blah, blah, blah. These were the years of tenacious searching for new forms and methods of work and the infusion of, of youth into this collective of genuine creativity, uh, blah, 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 blah. So let's see, I want to get into some of the specialties. Okay, come on, let's get to the cool part. This is all rambling. Well, who were these illegals? What were they like? Um, how were they chosen? These are fascinating topics. If our illegal intelligence officer goes abroad on his own documents, the documents of state, of our state, an illegal officer goes under foreign documents. Already he is not a citizen of our country. He is a foreigner. So to all intents and purposes, he's only known to very few people as, right, a deep cover operative. He transforms into a personality artificially created by us, a completely different person. He even begins to, uh, uh, un he be he begins to become unaccustomed to his native Russian language. Returning to Russia many years later, he begins then to speak with his accent. This profession is romantic and very complex. It is a heroic profession. We train illegals and we train them in a very unique way. We search for candidates and find them ourselves, selecting them through hundreds and hundreds of people. This is indeed one of a kind work. It can't be for everybody. In order to become an illegal, a person has to have many qualities. For example, first and foremost, bravery. They have to have an intent focus, a strong will. They have to have the ability to quickly forecast various situations. They have to be impervious to stress. They must have excellent abilities for mastering foreign languages. Good ad adaptation to completely new conditions of life and a knowledge of one or several professions that could provide an opportunity to make a living for the cover. Enumeration of personal qualities necessary for uh, an illegal intelligence officer could be listed uh, infinitely. So uh, the, quest the, the question comes up, if we found a suitable person, what's next is that he has the attendant training enumerated terms of all these characteristics and then uh, we know and determine if he will make a good intelligence officer some of these traits uh blah 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 he needs to have a special artistry he needs to have an ease of transformation and adaptation all right we already covered all that and he needs to have a sense of adventure the transformation of an illegal into another personality now this is interesting because i'm not I mean, there could be really advanced methods of like multiple personality. I suppose that's possible, but he likens it to uh, an actor. So it's literally becoming a lifetime actor so well that you kind of lose that old personality until it's time for it to come back. It's one thing to become a to come in, become someone else for a uh, theatrical uh, performance for a season, but it's another thing to become a different person for many years, a constructed person, to think and to dream in another language, to think in this person's other dimension. So we often joke that the illegals are going out into the operational arena as if they are an artist. So this is literally a unique situation where these people were like artists they had to it's performance art <laughs> but i mean it's performance art that will like get you killed if you're not good enough the labor of an intelligence officer is uh, incomparable with the work of an officer in some regular residency or in an embassy or as an analyst however tense the day of an intelligence officer's work uh, at an embassy uh, none of this could compare to what an illegal goes through the illegal has no native cover there's no place that he can go relax forget himself um and often he does not have actual real family members nearby. Because remember, the families are fake. They're constructed. He is, as the expression says, uh, fashionable, socially unprotected, and unprotected in general. Well, how are they trained? Well, over the time of this training, an illegal, uh, an illegal require, acquires a lot. Wide-ranging knowledge, particularly in uh, wide-scale political, geopolitical, economic matters. He's trained in a few professions and then multiple foreign languages. But he also sacrifices a lot because in these conditions, it is difficult to have a family. So these, these people don't actually have, you know, a full-time family. 
They don't have a wife, children, and parents, uh, maybe until after their service is done. Uh, and one rarely manages to resolve everything in a satisfactory manner. There's still another moment. The illegal is trained for work uh, cellularly by a narrow circle of instructors and trainers. So this, the limited communications effects tend to be negative. So this person is fairly isolated. They don't, they're not allowed to have a whole lot of meaningful connections because they're really only connected to uh, their immediate circle of people who are also illegals as part of the operation and then individuals uh, who are their handlers that right, are basically just bosses. So they don't get the ability to have and form many meaningful psychological interpersonal connections. He said, so what we had to do was, he says, to try to create as best we could a kind of surrogate family, familial connection uh, with our illegals and the handlers. And he says, um, could you name anybody who did really good at this and contributed to the KGB operations? He says, there are many and brilliant officers who did this work. Uh, it's hard to calculate the exact significance of each one. Um, Rudolf Abel or William Fisher was one and he became famous. He was very well known. He worked, of course, very hard in the acquisition of nuclear secrets uh, as well as collecting political information, though perhaps some other intelligence officer acquired no less information than Abel. But Abel was not only able to be capable of collecting information, he demonstrated tremendous bravery while he was in prison. He gave nothing away and posed as another person. He had a stoic behavior in prison that multiplied his glory. Another uh, illegal, Ish, 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 Iskak Akmarov, worked before and during the war and did very well for the KGB. If we were to weigh what he acquired, it would be, it would turn out that he acquired more than what Abel had. For seeing your questions, I composed a small directory of famous officers. Uh, number one, most famous Nikolai Kuznetsov, a legendary her heroic man full of a full-blooded Russian man who mastered German to pose as a German. That alone means a lot to us. He says other names would be uh, Conan Malady, known as Gordon Lonsdale. He was a resident intelligence agent in England and he acquired a lot of sensitive NATO materials. Um, Lonsdale worked I don't know what that means. He was an American Jewish person with roots in Belarusia. Not Alonzo, this other person that he worked with, Peter Cohen. Uh, and his wife, Elena Cohen. She was an immigrant from Poland. They also, by the way, worked with Rudolf Abel in the United States. So he's just listing some famous illegals who uh, successfully obtained significant secrets and information from uh, NATO and different operations. Uh, so a lot of these people, he says, were always working in the field. Eventually, some of them became chiefs. Um, he says this is in no way to demean other people who did this work, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so interesting, he says, at the beginning of the discussion, you said materials on intelligence have many fantasies and fables he says yeah there's a lot of lies and legends he says especially in recent years including various types of defectors and traitors so in other words you can't believe what defectors always say we've talked about that many of these defectors assert that illegals intelligence um was the structure of the kgb that carried out all the acts of retribution killing of traitors poisonings shooting stabbings <laughs> and stabbing people with umbrellas uh, he says, in the far off 1930s, Soviet intelligence, including the illegals, was charged with actions of destroying opponents uh, of the regime. Um, those cases are well known. Take the assassination of Leon Trotsky, uh, which was prepared by Soviet intelligence. But he claims that in more recent times, the illegals were not tasked with this. I think this comes up in the interview with Mark. There's another directorate that was in charge of assassinations so the illegals didn't really focus on that because that would blow the cover and you know, a lot of time and effort was put into training an illegal you don't want them out you know doing assassinations because 
it's they're too uh, valuable. And so there's another department that was tasked eventually with the illegals. So, I mean, I think that makes sense. But um, so let's see if he says it. This is almost at the end of the article. Let's see if he says anything else interesting. No, that's about it. So there was another article that was about one dude that was trained for this. How did they train them? This is a little more interesting in terms of the actual process. Um, anyway, to make a long story short, what's, what's neat about this is that the process of training is what you see in the Americans and at the beginning of Black Widow. I mean, it's just very surprising that they put that in there. That just kind of blew me away. So you can go read out Mark's other articles. You go to Espionage History Archive and he's got, I don't know, five or ten articles on illegals and the programs. And it's, it's all fascinating stuff, but, you know, real, real world spy stuff there. And again, sometimes the movies actually come pretty close to reality. By the way, been watching Babylon Berlin. Babylon will, Berlin will make an excellent analysis. I'm not recommending everybody necessarily watch Babylon Berlin, but is it? I don't know where they're going to take the show, so I'm not sure. I would say it's it's kind of pro-communist, I, I guess. Um, not that I'm surprised about that with Netflix. Um, but see, the weird thing is, is like, well, so is Weimar Germany good? No, they're degenerate in the democratic, Christian democratic party or whatever that nonsense is, <laughs> whatever that is. The Trotskyites are there as a faction. Organized crime is there as a faction. The Stalinists are there as a faction. The monarchists are there as a faction who want to help the Kaiser to come back. So there's a there's like five factions in Weimar Germany that are vying for power. So it's, it's it's very well done, and it's Tom Teichwer, right? Teichwetter being the, I guess, the most famous German director. Uh, I mean, there's other famous German directors, but uh, I guess Werner Herzog, right, is famous. Um, but Teichwetter did Run, Lola, Run. Uh, what's that one with Giovanni Ribisi and Kate Blanchett? Princess? Something like that? That was weird. It was okay. Uh, Teichwetter has another forgotten film that's good. About a car wreck and am a guy gets amnesia. Pretty sure that's Tom Tykeville. And then there's The International, which is a good international economic thriller, uh, which we've covered a couple times. Actually, I did an analysis of The International many years ago. Uh, and that's Clive Owen and Naomi Watts. Or maybe not Naomi. I think it's Naomi Watts. Clive Owen. And uh, yes, yeah, Naomi Watts, I think. Or it's either Laura Linney or Naomi Watts, but uh, the International's good. It's got a good conspiracy plot, and it actually talks about the deep banks banking establishment, which is real. So I'll give Tom Tyke the credit for uh, the International kind of highlighting the way the international monetary racket works. That's really he did good in that movie. That's what that's about. Cloud Atlas. Tyke Vetter did cloud and not not that great. I did do a essay analysis. I think he worked. He, I think he did that with the Wachowskis, so that was like a joint project, and that was a big a big bomb. But Tyke Vetter is a good director. I've never actually seen uh, what's the Parfum, um, that serial killer who is obsessed with perfumes. That was one of Tom Tyke Vetter's movies, but uh, he's a good director. He does does make good films. 
And then there's another one that I'm forgetting, another weird one about a guy in a, ends up in a hospital. I don't remember how that one ends, but... So, by the way, thank you guys for... Yeah, Cloud Atlas was terrible. However, there were a couple interesting elements in, in Cloud Atlas that I did like. So, again, remember, a lot of movies can be terrible. Even, like, a really bad movie can have an element to it that's pretty good or neat, right? Like, wow, that was a really neat shot they did there. Or that soundtrack was really cool. Or um, maybe the first third of the movie is really good, right? Um, so, I, I actually... The, the North the Korean future global super state, the dystopia, the Korean storyline in cloud Atlas is really good. <laughs> I mean, they should have just made the movie about that. That would have, that was actually pretty good, but do that Tom Hanks sequence and the Halle Berry. That was all terrible. Uh, but that Korean because they had a fast food religion, dude, that was cool. I mean, that was like, I've, I've always thought that's one of the neatest elements I've ever seen in a, in a sci-fi dystopia. And the way that when she, when he, you, they show you the fast food place and they, it's like a liturgy. That was genius. Uh, and if you remember, they're feeding people, people. So they're cloning people and feeding them fake food. So you see, that's that's pretty interesting. That's again, they should have just used the Korean storyline. That that alone would have been a really cool movie. A fast food religion. That's pretty awesome. Um, but everything else, that movie is pretty bad. But you can go read my analysis. I actually did an analysis at the time of it. So let's move on to the last one. Thank you guys for these super chats. Been very generous. We had a lot of fun tonight. And it's nice to get back in the groove of, you know, just kind of doing laid back, jokey, fun movie sequences. Yeah, I know about Swelling Green. By the way, uh, Jamie and I are almost ready for the next installment of the Chronological Dystopia movies. So as you know, we did, I think, uh, what do we do? We did 2001, 2010. And this next time up, in the chronological order of when the dystopias take place. Cloud Atlas. So Cloud Atlas is terrible, but it's got four or five storylines at different point, points in history and how they inter, interconnect. I know it's dumb through reincarnation. I know. I know. I don't believe in reincarnation. But the one storyline about there's this future dystopia where for some reason Korea is like runs the world and they have a religion in this future dystopia super state run by Korea and the religion is like a it's like a I don't know how to describe it but like it's like going to imagine a com combining McDonald's and a church dude that's what it is and uh, they're feeding people people I just thought that was genius like that that alone should have just been the whole that could be its own, own movie uh, and yeah, I've seen Swollen Green, obviously. Swollen Green will be in our next list of dystopian movies. It's going to be The Island, which I know I've already analyzed it, but we're going to do them all. We're going to go from the 80s, from 1984 dystopia, all the way up to Dune is what? The year 10191 in the year of our of Padi Shah Emperor Shaddam IV, 10191 or something. Uh, and then maybe Time Machine. I think Time Machine. In Time Machine, he goes to the year 800,000 or something ridiculous. So I think those are the last two. But uh, it begins with 1984 as a dystopia chronology. And now we're up to The Postman, Robocop, The Island, Snowpiercer. And I forget what else. But so basically those, those take place in like 20, 
2030, 2040. So that, that's where we are in our uh, dystopian timeline. So those should be coming up next. I think we're, we're done with most of those. But oh yeah, Back to the Future. I think when in Back to the Future 2, Marty goes to 2015. Yeah. By the way, hopefully the new villain of Wave of Dune will be good. It looks pretty badass. But All right, so uh, let's close with old. Um, Shyamalan can do really good, right? I mean, he, he he let's let's be fair. Worst case scenario, Shyamalan's hit and miss. Okay. I kind of like most Shyamalan. I even like The Happening. I mean, I know everybody hates The Happening. I kind of like it. The last time I watched it, I kind of felt like this is more like a an eco message. So I kind of liked it less than I did. But when you watch The Happening now, I'm starting to think, dude, people are going crazy like in The Happening. Now, The, the Happening wasn't about stabs but maybe 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 the, the happening was prophetic <laughs> in some way that nobody knew or expected i don't know but uh, it does seem to kind of have this eco message right but uh, i don't i just i don't think the happening is that bad i think i think it's uh, i think it's all right um servant i don't know what to make of servant uh, i i have to admit that i did watch the full season and i i was entranced i was i was captivated uh very interesting characters very bizarre story but bizarre in a uh in a way that you do keep going back to it um i like this cult that the that the uh nanny is from i mean that whole element it has a what are they like they're like a it's like Scientology meets uh, David Koresh meets Jonestown. And we don't know do they, how do they actually have the ability to do things. It's obviously... It's, so, it's neat. I, I, I do like... I mean, Shyamalan likes to do cult stuff. I appreciate that. I'm sure you guys have seen Servant. What do you guys think? I don't know what... Th it's all about food at the same time. It's just that there's this huge emphasis on food. When you watch old, you will see some of the oddest camera angles, shots. And some of it's pretty interesting. Some of it's creative. He's able to express the way that people are aging in unique ways through camera angles, through blurring scenes, suggesting uh, characters losing eyesight, the sound going away as characters lose their hearing. I mean... Some of the scenes, I don't know what's going on with, like, they're not even showing any, you're just hearing people talking. And I, I think my guess would be that we're supposed to feel very just disoriented when we're on this beach where all this crazy stuff's happening. I think that's all just to make us un disoriented and it works, which I thought was pretty neat. So I think he did achieve that. Um, and it has a great message. Again, signs, great message. I think signs kind of has a Christian message, honestly. I mean, the aliens are demons. Water destroys them. It's like baptism. I mean, they're kind of like archonic, demonic things. So, you know, I'll give props to Shyamalan because he, he seems to put, you know, decent messages in the films. So there's this resort... Uh, Anamika Resort. I don't know what that means. It's, I didn't look it up, but it's essentially kind of supposed to be paradise, right? So the idea is this Edenic return to paradise thing. And people think that they have uh, haplessly, organically chosen this resort, right? So it's like a super sandals resort. But we do get the idea that it's connected loosely to a gigantic pharmaceutical corporation. So already from the outset, uh oh, <laughs> we kind of know something's up with that, right? So red flags right away. The parents of the sort of protagonist family, uh, we know that they're fighting 
we think they might they might divorce. Uh, they have two kids. They are invited to a secret beach. So there's this resort, a lot of you know presumably wealthy people here. And then certain people are given by the head of the resort a special invite to a secret beach off the beaten path. Nobody knows how to get there or what it is. It's hidden. And it's hidden by this giant rock wall. So, of course, they uh, agree to it. Other select guests also are uh, invited, unbeknownst to them, on purpose to this secret beach. And we find that multiple people seem to have illnesses or problems, right, that they're dealing with. Um, one woman has a tumor. One woman has seizures. Uh, somebody has, you know, something else, whatever. Uh, calcium deficiency in her bones, blah, blah, blah. There is a rapper who I think he has some kind of health problem too. I think he has terminal cancer or something like that. He's going to die. And his name is Mid-Size Sedan, <laughs> which is, it's, it's like what a boomer would think a rapper names himself, but it's actually kind of funny to think of a rapper named Mid-Size Sedan. Um, and he takes his girlfriend and she dies. But we start to realize, as you can imagine, people, if you've seen the trailer, people on the island are growing old at a super fast rate. So like every 20 minutes is like a year or something. So the kids actually go through puberty in no time, which is kind of funny because they procreate in no time. They reach puberty and then somebody's pregnant and then in like 20 minutes, the baby's dead. And their baby's dead because they didn't realize that 20 minutes or like five minutes of laying a baby there is like a baby being unattended for three months. I don't know. So the baby dies. Uh, and then they figure out, wait a minute, we are on some kind of crazy time loop island. And it's not an island, it's a, a beach where time just goes super fast. But they notice that they are being observed from above at the top of this island under this sort of peak over looking, overlooking the rock wall. Uh, and they can't leave. Right? So they try to escape. You get kind of like frazzled and then you pass out so you, you can't leave this place you're stuck uh other similar sequences or movies it's kind of like lost meets lord of the flies not exactly but it's the closest parallels to this movie i could think of and there are elements of there are philosophical elements of even though we think of life going by really quick, as you get older, you realize, I mean, excuse me, we think of life being a long time, right? Oh, I've got 70, 80, 100 years before I'll die. We think of it being this long span of time. We have all this time, but then it's really not that long because by the time you're middle-aged, you realize how quick it goes by. And that's a big part of this film is thinking about how fast our lives go by and when we put things into the perspective of the eternal and actually many characters in this movie reflect on since they don't have much time how different their perspective is that they're connected to something bigger so he does he is kind of throwing in these ideas of god in a very subtle way which again i give, I give him credit for and i think clearly he's trying to do that um, he just probably can't come out and say God or Christianity because, you know, Hollywood is so hostile to that. But uh, that's there. That is that is definitely there in this film. Um, turns out they figure out, yes, this island for some reason has some kind of like magnetic force that just causes you to age really quick. And uh, Shyamalan, of course, plays the bad guy uh, or one of the bad guys. And he's part of the science team project. Spoiler alert going to spoil it to study the effects of drugs in a advanced state of progress so in other words rather than testing out drugs on people over 5 10 20 years they want to test out the drugs in a day 
so they can get a lot more scientific research. Now, so the idea is that, so it's a critique of scientism. That's the good message here. This movie is a critique of scientism. Scientism is working at the behest of big pharma here. So we got to we got to give credit to our boy Shyamalan. Uh, he's got a great message here. And we find out that the scientists are not neutral observers. They work for Fortune 100 and they have a rationale justification. Well, it's not bad for us to kill these people because it's for science. It's for the greater good, right? But see, science and greater good can become a justification for anything. Well, I'm just, you know, murdering you because I want to do science research. <laughs> so uh, if I just kill you and then I write a science paper on killing you, they see it's justified because I, I contributed to the greater knowledge of humanity. It's just, I mean, the, the justification is absurd. So uh, interesting stuff there. Yeah. That's, again, I think that's cool. So. We'll get props to show it. I don't know what's going on in Servant. What do you guys think? Have you guys seen Servant? I don't know. I guess we're waiting on a season three. There's season one and two. But uh, I've enjoyed Servant enough to keep watching it. And we will have a pretty, probably a pretty substantial breakdown of Babylon Berlin uh, when we finish season three. Because, you know, we, so they did a. 20 they did season one and two back in 2017 18 and then they waited and i guess just recently because it takes them a long time to make babylon berlin because they really put like a lot of time and effort into making the show which is part of the reason that it's so good but there's some really surprising elements you're going to find out uh, mk ultra mind control they actually reference the proto uh projects and research tavistock level stuff in Babylon Berlin they reference gold trains of gold in connection to revolutionaries I mean literally it's like out of Antony Sutton books pretty fascinating stuff that we'll see and then the interplay between organized crime espionage compromise intelligence creeper networks in season one whoa dude it's all in Babylon Berlin so look forward to that. There's even some esoteric elements we're going to see, especially with uh, Herr Gerion and his trauma. And what is Herr Schmidt doing with Gerion? Der MK Ultra. MK Ultra. Mind, mind controlen. Control. Controller. Main controller. <laughs> All right. So look forward to that. I'm not saying that you need to. I, it's up to you. Babylon Berlin is also uh, like the Americans. Um, has some adult themes. So it's not for the kids. Let's get to the Super Chat. Vladimir said for $10. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for your work. Uh, can't wait for your next book. Stop spending time on Catholics. Well, uh, I think I probably will actually take a brief period, a few months, uh, off of debates after the debate with Trent Horn. So we will debate, be debating Trent uh, in October. Obviously, Trent's a, you know, he's one of the apologists over at Catholic Answers. So we're, nef we're definitely not going to pass up that opportunity. Uh, but we have done, you know, a lot of debates in 2020 to 2021. So I'm just going to take kind of a brief break from debates, uh, not giving up debating, just taking a break. So we will continue to do this kind of stuff. And that will give me time, by the way, to work on the book because I can't write a book when I'm like constantly preparing for the next big debate. And, you know, if you're going to debate a sheikh, you got to read all these Muslim books. If you're going to debate Roman Catholics, you got to read all these Roman Catholic books. And yes, I've read a lot of these books, but I've read a lot of these books 10 years ago. So you got to, you know, you got to go and brush up, especially if you haven't, you know, thought about this or that issue in 10 years. Um, but uh, yeah, so it'll be fun. I think Trent and I are going to debate natural theology, Thomism, epistemology, 
transcendental arguments, classical apologetics. So basically that, those things. Jared, five bucks. Oh, wait. The Vladimir said, Orthodox KGB forever. Yes. Everybody in the Orthodox Church is KGB. Literally. Millions, hundreds of millions of KGB everywhere. Jared, five dollars. I do work that I feel I have something to contribute to. I do, Scarlett Johansson. I do work that I feel I have something to contribute to. Don't know. Does that mean <laughs> you're saying that she's playing a spy because she's a spy? I don't know. Uh, perhaps you can elaborate, Jared, on what that means. Absolute, or what she means. Absolute recoil, $5. It'd be cool if you reviewed a new 2021 horror movie called Gaia. I actually saw the trailer for Gaia. Uh, I thought about watching it, but then I was like, although this does look interesting, uh, it, this looks like just like more paganism. So you say it's about two pagans living in the forest. That's what I gathered from the trailer. Um, they take in a wounded forest worker and then the mushrooms attack. Well, that just sounds like something out of a nightmare from Terrence McKenna. The mushroom would never attack. Mel, $50. I love your content. Keep going on strong. Thank you, Mel. Hopefully, is that Mel Gibson? Is that Mel? Are they? Are they? Is that Mel? Is that Mel Gibson? Please tell me if you're down under. I'd like to have a conversation with you. Perhaps we could meet up with Crocodile Dundee. Have us a pint or two. Do you drink Forsters? J-Mel. $30. Is Mel and J-Mel? Mel Gibson? J-Mel? Mel Gibson? When you see a movie like Black Widow, do you think the studios are intentionally trolling, gaslighting? Is it a buzz for marketing? Uh... Nobody knows about the Soviet illegals, dude. I mean, who? even people that watch the Americans, do you think most Americans that watch the Americans know anything about the Soviet illegals or anything about espionage? No, they don't know anything. They're dummies. Uh, although the illegals was written and consulted by intelligence operatives, uh, Weinstein or whatever his name is. Anyway, you just look it up, CIA consultation on the Americans. Uh, I think there's a lot of things going on because, you know, a movie is made by a lot of people. So there's not just necessarily one person saying this movie is to gaslight everyone. <laughs> uh, there's different things going on. So there's people paying to have product placement. There's people who are artists who want to get their message out. There's people who want to foster an agenda. Uh, there's all those things going on. Is there still predictive programming? in modern movies uh yeah i think so i think some of the movies we've seen tonight, maybe not old but uh we've seen this goddess theme i mean that's definitely something coming up in movies if you guys do still watch isaac vyshop if you watch kj uh i mean they also have you know dissected movies for many years and noticed this con this continuing goddess theme so that's where we've all noticed it all of us uh trained movie detectives so we definitely are on to something if we're noticing these patterns so um yeah i definitely think and by the way after the coof what's that uh vexile vexel i mean go look up the anime movie vac vexel vex box i don't know how to say it there's a three minute clip somebody uploaded about literally we're living through what's in this anime movie it's crazy dude and that was, it's an anime movie from like, I don't know, 15 years ago. Trooper FN 525, five bucks. Even the KGB agent wizard sorcerer needs his coffee. I have it right here. Yuri Andropov gave me a fresh batch. Here in Moscow, in KGB headquarters, uh, we have, uh, since Dugan's running the show now, Yuri and drop offs kind of faded to the background. He basically is just a paper pusher. So we can, we all kind of joke around the office and we, we get Yuri to make the coffee. So former KGB director, Yuri Andropov, he's now kind of our barista 
and then you know Dugan and I just kind of sit around and tell everybody what to do uh, give you know we give out the KGB orders so that's how things work around here Beck style I own it we watch it again yeah go watch it people have been sending me this for years yeah Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say Old was a perfect movie. It's clearly had some problems and some flaws. There was some just stuff that didn't make sense. Uh, but I will give him credit for having a good message, especially in the present situation. So Anyway, thank you guys. Hope you had a good show. Please like and share. And I will talk to you soon. Go to Jason Alice's and subscribe. Blah, 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 all those things. Support our sponsors. As you know, we have uh, chalk.com. Get your mojo back. If you've lost it, I think you have. Except my audience is awesome because they never lose mojo. But some of you have lost mojo if you're new, and so you need to get it back. So go to chalk.com. The best Sheila Jet mushrooms. Put in the promo code JAY. You do get a discount. And then you can also buy signed copies of my books at Jay's Analysis. And I did. I did put up. Part two, finally, you guys, of Gary Heidnick. So we're getting caught up in our part twos. I know that was long delayed uh, due to the trip to Montana, but Gary Heidnick part two, that is the part two to Leonard Lake and Charles Ng. That went up yesterday. So go check out. Pretty crazy stuff going on with uh, Gary Heidnick. Wow. Crazy stuff, dude. And there's more serial killers, by the way. So we will. That has been a really popular series. I don't know why. I would have thought more people would like the Mob Mafia series. So the first Mafia video did great. Right? Got a lot of views. Mafia Part 2 got like 6,000 views. So I guess people weren't that interested in the Mafia talks. I mean, you can keep going with it. I think it's fascinating. And I still intend to do another installment of that from the Selwyn Rob book so we can get into uh, the 80, the 70s and 80s period and the John Gotti period, right? Um, which, I don't know, is fascinating stuff. I don't know why people wouldn't want to hear the uh, period of what, uh, Costello, um, Costellano. I always get Costello and Costellano mixed up. Their names are too similar. And you know that that one guy is totally part soprano paul castellano gambino boss paul castellano costello castellano costello older guy castellano 70s 80s and then we get john Gotti. now that's all fascinating i don't understand why nobody wants to know about this stuff like people don't realize dude organized crime is a big puzzle piece for all this stuff and understanding geopolitics and the intelligence agencies. I mean, if you don't understand, you're not going to understand any of this stuff. If you don't get that. So yes, I probably we will eventually do the next installment. I have a whole bunch of notes on all these guys on uh, Paul uh, Costellano and John Gotti. So we'll, we'll definitely get to that, but we haven't even got to the Vegas period, right? I mean, <laughs> dude, like you get you you get to the 60s and 70s and you gotta pull in vegas man how are you gonna understand how the world works and that's what we're here to do understand how the world really works so anyway thank you guys have a good night uh the next stop will be the part two of ezekiel no part two of rosemary's baby and human trafficking uh Ezekiel, and then we got Jamie and I have got to do um, the next dystopia installment. So that'll be up this week.